much for having me. I'm delighted to be a, a keynote speaker and present the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, be a hero for Net Zero Conference. What a great topic. We definitely need a lot of those heroes. Um, thank you to everyone for spending your Sunday afternoon worrying about the future and what we can do. Uh, may I also pay my respects to our Indigenous uh, elders, past, present and emerging on the land on which I speak from, but may we learn from them so we can build a safe and prosperous future together. Today, well, it's a pretty important topic. How do we galvanise action towards net zero by no later than 2050? How do we shift the dial with our elected representatives? And what can we do to cement our progress? They're all really big questions and there's a lot to be done. With only two months to go to the next conference of the parties in Glasgow, there's no doubt that we need to accelerate our ambition. I know Citizens Climate Lobby is hard at work for, on this because we do need to put a lot more pressure on the Australian government. So if you did a stock take, the organisations like Citizens Climate Lobby, you've been meeting with elected representatives, you've had tough conversation and you're pushing towards closer action. And I know, you know, my discussions in the back, in the hallways of parliament, more and more parliamentarians and colleagues are speaking out, but still not enough. And what we're seeing still is words, but not enough action. And I know CCL has been working hard on shifting the public attitude towards climate change. Uh, we learned, for example, only two weeks ago in the Australian Conservation Foundation national poll that now 67% of Australians support greater climate action. And a Lowy poll earlier this year found that over 78% of Australians want us to commit to net zero by 2050. So that's a really important shift. CCL and others have been at the centre of this massive social and economic shift that we're currently experiencing. And so everyone, thank you. Everyone should be really proud of your efforts. We're all playing our part. Of course, it was one of my big motivators to get into politics was to try and move the dial on our climate policy. The great news is business is also galvanised. More and more corporates are committing to net zero by 2050 and they're putting plans into action. And really not a week goes by without at least some announcement uh, of more large companies committing. We've now got 54% of the ASX one, top 100 companies who have that target of net zero by 2050. So one barometer of climate action is also reflected in the price of carbon offsets. Reputex has reported that carbon credit prices have now increased from $16 per tonne in 2019 to $23 due to the massive increased demand from business. Business are not waiting for the federal government, which is great. And obviously business is driven by pressure from consumers, from employees, from shareholders, and that is where everyone can absolutely play a part. Business is undoubtedly sending a clear signal that the government needs to move. We must move as a nation. And just last week, we even saw Twiggy Forest calling on the government to sign up to net zero. So if the miners are telling the government it's time to do it, then you know it really is time. But what we do need is something that's concrete. It needs to be legislated. It can't just be an empty promise. So we know the Morrison government is edging towards net zero by 2050, um, as you know, it's a preferably as soon as possible, uh, but we really need to remove the higher handbrake. You know, the tricky language and the spin is really not acceptable for an issue like climate and something that's so important. Uh, there's, of course, coming from the government, always a lot of talk around that we're going to meet and beat uh, our targets. Now, what we need to be really clear is our targets are nowhere near strong enough um, and they do not address uh, the challenge we have ahead and what we need to do. So it's likely that the government's going to announce something in the lead up to Glasgow. But it's very unlikely that they are going to sign up and legislate it properly uh, because it's nothing in their planning at the moment that actually delivers that. We know the National Party, in fact, are a stumbling block. So anyone that is in a seat with national uh, MPs, it's really important to put the pressure on. Uh, they, you know, the, the, the Barnaby Joyce becoming the deputy leader again uh, is, is a major drawback and, and, you know, a backward step for climate policy. Uh, the major concern is that they, obviously there's going to be negotiating going on and, and what's likely to happen is that the, they will argue for carve-outs and that should be rejected because I think carve-outs will mean a sector will actually lose out on the opportunity of benefiting from the transition to net zero. Uh, it really needs to be across the whole economy. So uh, 
And I think industries, it, they will become uncompetitive in a carbon constrained world uh, if they're not part of the transition plan. So it's really important for the for CCL to actually be onto this and really lobby strongly against any kind of carve outs. So we know the COP26 is going to be incredibly important. Alex, Alex Sharma, the COP26 president, he stated that Glasgow is our best chance to build a green, healthy and wealthy future. And I agree. It's the opportunity for Australia uh, to really uh, step up to the challenge of what need, we need to do. At the moment, we are climate laggards. Uh, the bulk of our trading partners have committed to net zero commitments. And we really is time for Australia to step up and do its bit. Uh, I mean, we know we've got no time to waste and we know we're at the forefront of impacts. The recent uh, IPCC report found that we're warming faster than we anticipated and we're hurtling towards 1.5 degrees of warming by the 2030s. And that should be alarming to everyone. We already saw during the 2019 bushfire season in Australia that clearly we are incredibly exposed. During the inquiry on the climate bills, we saw that a huge amount of coastal infrastructure is at very real risk of uh, coastal erosion, flooding and uh, unprecedented weather events. So it's really important that we acknowledge uh, the risk that, and the challenge that we face. Every degree matters. Warming of 1.5 degrees is already dangerous and it's unfortunately pretty much locked in. But once we cross that threshold, we risk more uh, extreme weather and really uh, horrendous outcomes. Tipping, if tipping points are breached, uh, we will quickly lose control. And we can't let that happen. So that is the message we need to take to parliamentarians. We need urgent and deep cut to emissions uh, to halt warming. So, and I know to many of you, this is not new, um, but still many politicians won't listen to these calls of the IPCC. They ignore it. Uh, they tend to still fall back on the idea that Australia is just one nation and what can we do if the rest of the world isn't moving and how can we ultimately change that course. But we absolutely can because, as we know, every 1% of contribution matters and we are a major contributor on a per capita basis to global emissions. So the politics of climate change is complex and progress is slow, especially in Australia where climate change politics has been incredibly divisive. And of course, we have the influence of fossil fuel donations on decision makers. Uh, fossil fuel companies have for decades been spending to make sure that they are at the table and in the room when decisions are made. And that is a major problem. We saw research come out just last week that the fossil fuel industry donations have doubled to the major parties in the last four years. And that's on both sides of politics, which is why we aren't progressing this. We should be progressing reforms that prohibits donations from fossil fuel companies. We've seen one example with the chair of Empire Energy, an oil and gas company donating money to the Liberals. And now, of course, they've recently been granted the $21 million contract to frack the Beetaloo Basin. Developing the Beetaloo Basin is something I strongly oppose in Parliament. It could increase Australia's emissions by almost 8%. It's an absolute methane bomb waiting to happen. But there's also the fact that both major parties seek to form government and have to, they balance the competing interests of different constitu constituencies um, where independents don't. It was very disappointing when I introduced the amendments to try and restrain uh, the fracking for the Beetaloo Basin, but both Labor and the Coalition voted against and, and voted for this. So that's a major problem, that we don't have really strong political will on either side of the political divide. You have in a, and which is why I would argue there is a rise of independence because people are frustrated that the major parties are simply not doing what needs to be done. In these inner city urban seats who are environmentally conscious and have, for example, uh, you have the traditional blue collar communities that have relied on fossil fuel based industries of the past, but all communities are now aware of the risk and moving towards uh, need and demanding strong climate action. That's why you see polit politicians way too often they say one thing in the cities and then they'll say one thing in the regions but more importantly they say one thing at election time and they do an entirely different thing once they are in Canberra and that is a major problem accountability of politicians is incredibly important 
The one thing I've observed as a first-term politician is most MPs care about their job. They care about their pre-selection and that is why they toe the party line. But at the end of the day, the people that put them in the job are the people that vote for them. And so that's why it's really important for people to be aware of the challenge. A recent investor group on climate change report found that 75% of coal jobs will be gone in 30 years' time. And I think that's a conservative estimate because the transition is happening much faster than what was anticipated. So all those communities that are being sold this idea that we can stop progress, that we can stop time, we can stop things moving on, are being left without a plan. They're being left without a transition plan. And that is a real problem. What we need is actually straight talking MPs and politicians and leaders in communities and build businesses. We need to be honest about the transition that's happening. Communities are going to need a positive transition plan to look forward to, um, not dream ideas and fantasies that somehow coal is going to continue and oil and gas industries are going to go on forever. So in your engagements, you must stress that there are tremendous opportunities in the transitions for these communities because that's a problem. You're asking them to leave something they know for something they don't yet know. And in, it's incredibly important to highlight the positives. The, to, the, po the opportunities in Australia are incredible and they are ironically opportunities for our regions to inject life into the regions. Solar and wind are the cheapest form of energy generation in history. We can harness them to manufacture things in Australia. We can reverse the manufacturing exodus that has been happening for decades. We can make turbines, we can make jet engines, solar panels, batteries, mining equipment, even vehicles here using our almost free electricity. Last month, I met with Energy Estate about their plans to develop a hydrogen industrial precinct in the Hunter. Beyond Zero Emissions has modelled that we could create 34,000 jobs and attract $28 billion in investment and $11 billion in revenue by 2032 through a Hunter industrial precinct. So if it's not possible to transition industrial workers to these precincts, then we do need to look at the Fair Transition Fund for them. Spain and Germany have both wound, wound down their fossil fuel industries um, and their miners and workers were retrained, educated, redeployed to clean jobs. So it's really important that we have this conversation. It has to be part of the conversation to transition and to net zero. So if we aren't able to find uh, work for certain workers, um, they need to be able to have pensions or uh, workers in Gladstone, in the Pilbara, in the Hunter and Gippsland can should need to rest easy that we they will be looked after in the transition. But that won't be possible unless we plan for it. Industrial precincts uh, and the fund could be rolled out across the nation. We know these things are possible. But I expect that the politics of climate change will remain fraught and bipartisan um, bipartisanship is elusive. Uh, too often the major party sees this, sees this topic as an opportunity to try and wedge the other side. They try and appeal to a community to win votes at the next election and they ignore the major, um, the major long-term planning that is required for this transition to happen well. We know that with concrete examples we can build a case for positive change and politicians should be able to respond to that. Communities are around Australia are organising their own grassroots campaigns. They're establishing voices of groups all over the place, looking for alternatives if the major parties are unable to break the deadlock. And it's really important uh, that those grassroots organisations, uh, they are looking to bring forward climate uh, and integrity forward uh, through their campaigns. Um, and it's important to support those efforts because the more people we have around the table, the more we will have a holistic and uh, constructive discussion about what needs to be done. Uh, I know the coalition is rather danger uh, uh, frightened, I would say, of uh, what uh, grassroots movements can accomplish uh, because it's really, uh, it, it goes against the grain of the political um, sort of model of major parties to leave it to communities to really bring forward uh, and demand better representation. But it really is an important thing. So I hope you're all aware of the groups maybe in your regions. Of course, the Climate Change Bill was my, um, I put for, put for the Climate Change Bill in November because I committed at the last election to try and break this by this partisan brinkmanship over climate policy and put forward a sensible plan. 
Uh, they're still on the table. I will be representing them uh, to Parliament in October when uh, sitting resumes. Um, of course, you would know, um, and I thank CCL, you've been ardent supporters of the climate change bills, and I really thank you for that. So I, the bills were referred to the Environment and Energy Committee for inquiry, and we received over 6,500 submissions from individuals, community groups, unions, businesses, NGOs, and peak bodies. It was a fantastic and surreal um, response, unanimously in support of debating and passing the bills. Um, there's no doubt that it was also rang true with our business community. So we were able through the inquiry to bring together the business council, industry groups, the Australian Medical Association, architects, local governments, even the ACTU, uh, the electrical trade unions, all together because they are looking for framework legislation that would give us clarity and certainty on our climate policy. One, uh, to quote the Business Council of Australia, the policy framework in the legislation provides an architecture which will be critical to mapping out a planned and predictable approach to emissions reduction across the economy as we work towards the net zero target in 2050. And as we've all seen with COVID, it's incredibly important to have well-planned execution. Uh, you can't just have knee-jerk policy, policy done on the run with hindsight or retrospective. It's really important that for this challenge, we plan it well in advance to ensure we are at the forefront of opportunities and in fact, we, Australia benefits. So I've listened to all the feedback uh, that many sent in to the inquiry um, and have, we have accepted some of the amendments and uh, uh, changes that were suggested. Uh, for example, uh, some of the review, um, I've incorporated some changes like having a review of the Act every 10 years, uh, similar to the EPBC Act. Um, also, the emissions reduction plans and adaptation plans will now be disallowable instruments so that they are scrutinised in Parliament. Uh, that gives Parliament that opportunity and oversight. There will be now a positive duty on the Minister responsible for climate change to ensure that the emissions bud budgets the objectives of emissions reduction plans and the adaptation plans are met. That brings the bill more into line with the legislation that was passed in the United Kingdom and New Zealand. The most uh, substantial change um, is uh, at the moment there will be a likely inclusion of an interim 2030 or 2031 target in relation to the second budget. As you'd be aware, uh, the bill proposes for five yearly emission reduction budgets to be um, uh, presented by the Minister on the advice from the Climate Change Commission. Obviously, with the release of the IPCC report, we find ourselves now in a situation where we must put in strong interim targets. So uh, obviously the imperative is that we need to more than double our emissions reduction ambition by our interim target of the 2030s. Uh, and so that is something that will be now included in the bill. Uh, that puts us in line with our major trading partners and international peers like the United States, Canada and Japan, and obviously something that we really need to have for COP26. There will be other technical and minor changes, which you'll be able to see when it goes up, um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that then. But I look forward to getting uh, all your feedback. I thank you all for your incredible enthusiasm and energy, uh, absolutely, in pushing forward this issue. We need to have a sensible plan around how we do this. We need to ensure the principles of the bill are really adhered to, which is we need to make sure we are doing this in a, in a just and equitable way. We, can, we must ensure generational equi equity. We must make sure we do our share of the transition and reducing emissions. This cannot be left to future generations because we know that we will pass tipping points but because it really is our legacy and it is our, um, it is our responsibility to ensure we do this. So I feel, this, I feel very strongly about this. I look forward to many debates on the issue uh, in Parliament and especially in the lead up to COP26. Thank you. Well, thank you for that inspiring presentation, Zali, and, and thank you for your comments and praise and, and all that you're doing. Um, so we have a, a few minutes for some questions and there's been a, a flurry of questions in the chat, which Rod has been collecting and um, can ask. Um, but first I'd like to ask one question of you. Uh, you mentioned earlier 
about the weakness of the commitment without bipartisanship. And, and, I, and I guess from that perspective, how do we move this forward, assuming that net zero emissions by 2050 will be committed to in time for COP26? Well, it's more the question, I mean, look, I anticipate that uh, the Prime Minister is likely to commit to net zero by 2050, but the reality is the world has moved on from a commitment to net zero by 2050. Um, that is our long term, that's the end of the game plan. But what we do need now is the focus on our interim target. Um, that is something the Morrison government is not going to want to do. They are not going to want to be held to account for something they have to deliver soon. Um, that is the, the further they can kick this down the road, the happier they will be. Uh, and so I think it's incredibly important in that lead up to COP that the focus be squarely on our interim target. Of course, the ultimate goal is we need to be at net zero and we must do so as soon as possible, but certainly by no later than 2050. But we need to do the bulk of the work in the next decade. That's Thank you, a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, Rod. Yes, there was quite a few in the chat, um, Zali, and uh, the first one um, comes up is, um, is what, what do you think about having more pro-climate independence, winning seats and possibly holding the balance of power as a way of moving things forward? And, and how important is the vices? How, how, what role are the voices moving playing in this? Absolutely vital, <laughs> is the way I would say. Uh, your quickest way of ensuring that we have, uh, that we legislate net zero by 2050 and a strong interim target and a good plan to get there is to have no less than three additional uh, independent uh, MPs join me in Parliament. Incredibly important. At the moment, I am two people, two votes short, uh, short in the House of Reps to get this through. And whilst we have many MPs that talk a big game on climate change, you know, we have many uh, Liberal MPs who will say they committed to net zero by 2050, but then their vote and their actions never match that commitment. And I have to say, I, the same goes with Labor. Um, time and time again, Labor will commit to net zero by 2050, but then they make decisions that are also contrary to that because they're worried about election prospects. So when, for example, the Beetaloo Basin came up, um, they supported the coalition in fracking the Beetaloo Basin for gas. Now, we know we cannot afford to do that. All coal and gas must stay in the ground from now on. The International Energy Agency has made it very clear that we need to stop. We need to transition away from those. And the irony is... We know from uh, the Australian, well, from AMO and its integrated systems plan, we have sufficient gas now to manage the transition and to make sure that as the coal-fired power plants retire, and they are likely to retire sooner than what was originally scheduled because they're completely un, um, uncompetitive in the market, um, we have sufficient gas. We do not need to be exploring for more gas. So it is only independents that are really prepared to draw the line in the sand on this. And at the end of the day, if we have the numbers, whoever forms government will have to pass strong climate legislation. So I think the most, um, uh, the best outcome for climate action in Australia is a minority government with a balance of power held by independents. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, a great question from Trent. How do you think we can create a social landscape that better utilizes the knowledge of experts? For example, climate scientists, engineers, and public health experts in Australia's formal policy and decision-making processes. Well, look, organisations like you promoting the experts, making sure people have access to that information is incredibly important. Um, we, I think we have seen a shift in the last three years, I feel since the last election, we've had this, we, there has been so much more uh, conversation and awareness of the experts and of the evidence. Obviously, we have been subject to impacts um, through bushfires um, and, and we've seen horrendous incidents all around the world and hitting time and time again temperature records. Um, so I think that expertise and, and, and listening to the experts is becoming a lot more um, widespread. And I think through COVID, we've also seen the importance of listening to experts to be able to calculate and plan outcomes and to match policy to expert advice. 
Um, and that's what we desperately need to do around climate. We, we simply cannot afford to be putting our head in the sand for any longer. And unfortunately, the government is doing that. So I, you may not be aware, uh, currently the Morrison government is planning a uh, market mechanism, which is essentially a coal keeper. It is to pay thermal energy producers, so coal, to stay in the system longer to ensure whilst the transition occurs. Now that is the worst thing that can happen uh, and really needs to be called out because what's happening is they're uncompetitive. Uh, they're right, you know, the major thermal coal uh, companies are writing huge losses. Um, and so basically public money will go to funding the uh, extending the life of uh, thermal, thermal energy production, production, which is a terrible thing. I've just been given the nod for one more question, um, Zali, and uh, uh, what contribution can the Parliamentary Friends Group make to building bipartisan support for action? Uh, well, look, we've that has obviously an initiative of independence. Helen Haynes, Rebecca Sharkey and myself set that up. Many people joined. Not so many from the coalition have attended the meetings, I should say, and it would be important mm -hmm. for you to go and ask your member how many meetings they have attended. Yes. Um, we have provided access to experts around a number of topics from electric vehicle policies, obviously to the health, health impacts of global warming uh, and then science of climate change. Um, so obviously we are, we're trying to bring MPs from both sides uh, of politics together to understand and be aware of the science so that when they're making their choices, they do so with full knowledge of the impacts.